every single time, and I'll post it on our Facebook page. Uh, and if I can remember, I'll post on the church page and then I forget to put it on my own. So I'll try to do that from now on. But uh, the parsonage will be open if there's severe weather coming. If they're calling for tornadic activity, it will be open, okay? Uh, you can come go in the basement. There's usually water in the refrigerator. Um, so just be watching out on our Facebook page for that. May the 19th, am I right, Dean? <laughs> No, I know. Right. So the men's ministry met for breakfast at Puckett's, and uh, we we decided we wanted to uh, create a fund to where we can help at times when, like with the tornado damage and stuff like that, something that we can pull from to help the community uh, monetarily uh, through donations and stuff like that. So one of the first things we're going to do is have a pancake breakfast. Men's ministry is going to cook us some pancakes and a piece of sausage or two, and it'd be May 19th, around 9 o'clock to 10, over at the FCC. Um, we haven't set a price on that yet. I just realized that. We'll come. Our don we're going to do it through donations. Donations alone. Thank you, Buster. That's why I keep Buster around. Uh, <laughs> or he keeps me around to make him look better. I don't know what happened there. Uh, so May 19th, and then it's not in your bulletin. I wasn't able to get that to a before she bring these out. Said didn't pay attention. Uh, oh, I just didn't pay attention. You know what, folks? I tell you what, if they ain't picking on you, they don't love you. Is that, is that how that goes? I am loved so much. <laughs> it's the weekend, uh, the 11th. Yeah, the day before Mother's Day. We're going to, we have. So I posted on the Facebook page again. I forget to post it on my own personal page, but it is open to all men in the community. Okay, so it's it doesn't do they can't they don't just have to be here from Franklin Baptist Church. It's a men's ministry. So May 11th, bring a friend, come out to Puckets, um, sit with us, enjoy some fellowship. That's where we kind of hash out what we're going to try to do as far as fundraisers or what we need to do in the community. Uh, and later on this summer, when things kind of calm down, we'll have a Bible study. Uh, last one was pretty successful, so uh, just be watching out for that. Uh, church weekly hours. So I travel a lot with my job, but a lot of times on Mondays and Fridays, I'm here. So between about 8.30 and 12 or 12.30, I'll usually be over at the parsonage, and the church building will be open uh, for you to come by if you want to come by and pray. If my car is not here, I'm not here. I'm not hiding from you. I didn't park across the street, so nobody knows we're here. Uh, but if my car is here, you come by, or you can call me. My number's on this bulletin. Okay, you can call me or text me anytime. Uh, if you want to come by and have a cup of coffee, just sit and talk or pray together. Um, that's what that's what we're all here for. And I think that's it. What's that? Oh, we had an organ over here in the uh, parsonage. And if anyone's interested in it, come see me. What's that? Speak now? Oh, Amy's won't get rid of it. Does anybody in here know anybody that would like to have an organ? It works. You have to listen carefully because it's not extremely loud. But it works. Or maybe we don't know how to work it yet. That could be too, but... I had the volume all the way up and it wasn't very loud. But if, if nobody wants it, but we figured we'd give you first shot at it. Nobody? So Auction it off. Auction it off. Nobody gonna bid on it. <laughs> Can't hear it. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Oh, stay at the end of church today too, if you don't mind. We're having a business meeting, special business meeting today. Nobody brought any drive up hard fruit or anything like that. Okay. It's a business meeting to hold the vote uh, on me becoming a pastor at Franklin. So if you don't mind, stick around for a few minutes. It won't take very long. I am begging. I am begging. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Oh, man, it took you long enough. I guarantee it. Casey, you got a birthday today. I ain't going to ask you how old you are. Unless you really want to tell me. It's Thursday. It's Thursday, be 32? Yeah. 32. Say that. 
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's stand and sing happy birthday.
Sorry. Uh oh. Here it's all go. good. that have been away for so long 
that are longing to come back, Lord, I pray that you be with them. I pray that pray that you be with us to give us the wisdom to reach out to those folks and, and let them know how they're missed. And I pray that you be with those that have mentioned and those that we haven't mentioned. There are so many suffering right now, Lord. But we know that you are the the ultimate physician, the ultimate healer, and we know you have your hands on them. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to guide and direct us in the ways we should go. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen.
If y'all knew how nervous she was, it's so hard to get up here in front of sing in front of people. Sometimes you do things. I got beat earlier. <laughs> she didn't run out the door, so we're good. All right. So I know y'all are waiting on the joke, so just give me a second. Right? That's what we're all here for. God was talking to his angels. He said, you know what I just did? I just created 24 hours of alternating light and darkness on earth. Ain't that good? And the angels said, well, what are you going to do now? And he said, eh, I think I'll call it a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't throw me. Boy, it was late to Sunday school one Sunday morning, and the teacher, she was concerned because he was always on time. She said, Johnny, is anything wrong? He said, no, ma'am. He said, I was going fishing, but my daddy told me I ought to get on up and go to church. The teacher was impressed. She said, did he explain to you why it was more important to go to church than go fishing? He said, sure did. Daddy said he didn't have enough bait for both of us. <laughs> One more. <laughs> Pastor was in the middle of the sermon and he looked out and he noticed this man who had fallen fast asleep with his head on his wife's shoulder and he said, wake him up right now. And she looked at him and smiled and said, you're the one putting him to sleep. You wake him up. <laughs> Highlight of my week is looking for jokes. <laughs> so, so last week we started talking about the armor of God. And, and the protection that it provides. And this week I want to kind of break down that armor piece by piece. And just what it means. I said something last week and I got kind of questioned about it a couple of times. About where we said, are we to take the fight to the devil? Well in verse 13 of today's scripture, we, we aren't to take the fight to the devil. But to stand firm against everything he throws at us. And when we study this scripture, anytime you're studying scripture... You need to look underneath of it. And what I mean is you really need to dive in because just at face value, it's hard to take that in, right? So you really got to look at the details. And when you're looking at this scripture, some people might wonder why on earth is the belt the first piece that's mentioned? Why not a shield or something to cover your chest up with, right? I mean, the belt's not really going to offer you a whole lot of protection. But if you look at it, it, a belt is a, a pretty common piece of clothing, but it's important. And don't forget, we're talking about the metaphors, and, and when they're speaking about this, metaphors for spiritual armor to fend off the enemy's attack. It's truth that makes up the belt. And the truth comes from God. Right? That, and that should be the language that all Christians speak. The language of the devil we know are lies. Right? False testimony. They're, they're lies. And that kind of should make us question every day which language do we speak? Because if we speak the truth, we're speaking God's language. If we're lying, we're speaking the devil's. And it's a pretty important, and, and one might sit back and go, well, duh. I don't lie. If you just said that or thought that <laughs> while you're sitting here, it is all of us at some point in time have even told those little white lies. But folks, that's where the devil says, oh, look, the door open. Here's my chance. They're weak. They're weak. And that's another area is he's really sneaky at. We've got to be careful and be truthful even when it makes us uncomfortable. It's very important. So what's the purpose of wearing a belt? Most importantly is to keep your pants up, Right? Now, this is, whether this is appropriate or inappropriate, could be my last Sunday, might not be, we don't know yet. Your, your associate pastor, soon to be hopefully pastor, has no butt. None. And he just said none. I was cursed with that my whole life. So if I don't wear a belt, I'm going to be in Henry County Local every week for indecent exposure because my pants ain't going to stay up. Right? So, so that's, that's what the belt's supposed to be for. 
and, and it may sound crazy, but can you imagine going into a battle with no belt and having to hold your pants with one hand and your weapon with the other? Because usually, see, Roman soldiers, they've got a shield, they've got a, they've got a sword, but they're going to have to put one of those down. I'd be in trouble. If I didn't have belt on, I'm getting ready to go into a battle, right? Because I'm only, I'm, do I get a shield? Do I get a sword? Because i got to have one hand on my pants. So, so we got to, and, and i got to have something to put the sword in. So that means the soldier has to put a weight or down the shield. Spiritually speaking, if you're not wrapped with that truth of God, your belt is weak. And the belt has to be strong all the way around you. It has to maintain all the way around. The lack of truth in a Christian's life exposes our bodies to damage. Spiritually speaking, it just opens the door for anything and everything to come in. The belt of truth helps us to fight against evil lies, distortion of the facts, insinuations against us. And I believe fully that the belt is mentioned first because it's the most important piece. It actually holds all of the armor together. All the armor is held together and secured by the belt. It keeps everything in place. And spiritually, the truth of God is what holds everything together in a Christian's life. Because without that truth, all the rest of it just falls apart. It allows that soldier to march without holding his sword and wearing himself out trying to keep the rest of his armor together. We have to surround ourselves with the belt of truth in order to withstand what the devil's going to throw at And you might be thinking, well, it's pretty obvious, but it's important enough that they mentioned it in here because we tend to lose fact of that. One little, one little thing like telling that little white lie or not being truthful with someone, no matter how much it hurts or no matter how much pain it causes you, we have to hold that together. And a lot of people wear belts for more of a fashion statement than they do to use it, right? When I played shows years ago, I had this belt. I had two of them, big belt buckle, like I was a cowboy or something. Whatever, long, long time ago. Lights would shine off of it like a championship belt. When I got on stage, that made me feel like I was somebody. It did nothing to hold my pants up. By the end of the show, I was constantly doing this, but I was not going to change that belt because I thought it was cool. I thought it looked good. Sadly, that's what type of belt a lot of people wear when it comes to their spirituality. We, we, we put that belt on for more fashion than what it was meant to do. If your belt of truth is just for show, you may fool people but Satan's not fool. He knows. He's not stupid. He knows that a false appearance of a person living and walking in truth will be their downfall in that battle. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God is the truth. And we are to wrap ourselves in that every single day. Next is the breastplate of righteousness. Now this was like a central piece, right? This is what, this is what the Roman soldiers wore to protect their torso, their hearts, their lungs. Their, everything was, was protected by that. It was fitted with loops and buckles and it was attached to a thick belt. Without the belt, there's no chest plate, right? If the belt was loose, then the breastplate would just slip right off. So it's the truth that makes up the belt right and the righteousness that makes up the breastplate. And to be righteous is to do what? Is to do right in God's eyes. God's commandments are righteous. In contrast, lawlessness and sin, and sin is the opposite of righteousness. So that breastplate, God guards our heart and assures us that God is going to protect us from feeling like we're not loved or feeling like we're not approved of. I work with customers in four different states, and I, and I love the company I work for. We sell really good products, and I'm not what you would call a tree hugger, I guess. If, if somebody's looking to tear down a tree, I'm going to stand in front of it 
But, but I do believe that we are to take care of the things in this world around us that God has provided for. I like the grass to be green. Get a little rain here and there. Maybe not as much as we had last week, but a little bit here and there. So, so the company I work for, we, that's what we do. We sell hazard-free hazard products. Well, when a customer says, oh, your stuff ain't working, I take offense to that. How dare you say something's not working? Because I believe in this company. I believe in what I do, and I wouldn't be working there if I didn't. So I take heart to it. Now, they didn't say it to hurt my feelings. Right? Maybe they were trying to make something better, but of course we all know better than anybody else. Right? We, we know more than anybody else is trying to help us out. But there are times that people will tell you things just to tear you down. They'll tell you things just to hurt your feelings so that you'll feel lower than they are. And that's where the breastplate comes in. All of that negativity. All of that negativity. Maybe somebody doesn't believe like you believe. And that's one we struggle with. Maybe somebody questions, why do you go to church every Sunday? Why do you pray to someone that you can't see or hear? I get that one a lot. That's where the breastplate comes in. That's where the breastplate of righteousness comes into play because it's going to deflect that arrow of negativity that's meant to bring harm to my faith. If someone asks you that question, you might say, have you ever asked God why you pray? You might be surprised when you hear an answer. The righteousness of Christ implanted in us fortifies our hearts against all of Satan's attacks. But without a breastplate, soldiers pretty much ask him for death, right? It's like taking a knife to a gunfire. You have no protection there. So every little thing that comes into your heart just breaks down your faith a little bit each time. But with a sturdy breastplate, the very same attacks become ineffective. They become useless. Spiritually speaking, you've got to guard your heart from that evil. You might say, so how do we use it? We're instructed to put on this armor. And I think that's one of the key things to this scripture. We're suggested to put on the armor. You didn't wake up with that armor on this morning. You might have had it on yesterday. And today you might not have it. It's not something that's granted to you. Oh, here you go. Here's my protection right here. You got it right here. Whether you want it or not, here it is. We're instructed to put it on. Putting on the armor of God requires a decision on your part. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, you've got to first have the belt of truth firmly in place. Because one item doesn't work without the other. Without truth, our righteousness would be based upon our own attempts to impress God. And that never works out. It leads to self-condemnation, which we know that's not what Jesus wants. That's not what we're taught. We choose instead to acknowledge that apart from Him, we can't do nothing. That's when we've got to lay our egos aside and say, I can't get through this world without you, Jesus Christ. We see ourselves as in Christ, and that regardless of our failures, His righteousness has already been paid. It's just like if you ever see a bank tell you, you know, sends an overdraft fee. Well, nowadays, most banks are like, well, we're going to cover that. You, you might have to make a little bit up, but we're going to cover that. He's already credited your account. Jesus Christ has already paid for your sin. So we see ourselves as in Christ, if that's been done. We put it on by seeking God and His righteousness above everything else, no matter what else you've got in your life. And that's hard to hear sometimes, no matter what family, no matter what you've got going on. Nothing is above God. And as long as you're living your life that way, you're not going to sit around and think, well, well, I love my children. I like my dog. You're not going to think about that. But if you keep God up here and everything else down here, that's what we're to do. That's putting on the armor of God. And you become more open to what God has planned for you and maybe not so hesitant to accept 
that he knows better. And see, there's a lot of people that say they believe in God. Satan believes in God. There's a lot of dictators that have caused a whole lot of death in this world that believe in God. It's one thing to say you believe in God and another to say you believe God. If you believe in God, that's great. If you don't believe God, you're just as lost as you was yesterday. To put on the breastplate of righteousness, you receive protection it offers you because you believe God. You can look at it this way. Our faith in Jesus has put us in right standing with God. His righteousness has been assigned to us because that moment Jesus Christ took his last breath for you and me on that cross, that day our sins were taken. And he's been called, he's called the Lord of Righteousness in Jeremiah 23 says. It says in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. Folks, our hearts are so important. So important when it comes to righteousness because they are desperately wicked from the get-go. And it's hard to wrap your mind around that because you got, you know, your, your heart's not exactly set up the way it's supposed to be until you know Jesus Christ. Proverbs 69 says, In their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Matthew 15, 19 says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. And so I, I got to talk about this. I wasn't going to. Brother Jackie, I love you. Earlier this week, and I don't know if anybody's read I started doing a devotion on Friday. There was a church that, that talking about false testimony and slander that has taken the word of God and just thrown it on the ground and stomped them. Not welcoming people into the church because they may have a different view or, or may have a difference of opinion. Making them sign a covenant that says, yeah, yeah, we're going to listen to you and only you. Not God. We're going to listen to you. Talking to the pastor. That can't happen. Those doors do not have a members only sign on them. Ever. In my mind, that is no longer a church. And I can promise you, and there ain't no chance that that would ever happen at this church as long as we're here. False testimony and slander will absolutely destroy people. And there are so many people that are hurt, and I ask that you pray for them daily. Pray for the leaders that are doing this because something ain't right. But we have, we have to be mindful of that. So to make a solid, godly stand against the schemes of the evil ones, because there's no doubt in my mind Satan's got his hands all over that one. We must put on that which covers our hearts. Christ's righteousness covers our hearts. He gives us the only protection that's guaranteed against the devil. As we wear the breastplate of righteousness, we begin to develop that pure heart that translates into actions. Because if you put that armor on and all that negativity starts going away, and, and, and your relationship with Christ gets a little bit stronger each day, people out there are going to see it. People out there are going to say, man, this, guy, this, this guy's changed. Wonder, wonder what caused that change. And then you can start that conversation and let them know that Jesus Christ is the only way. The only way. But we've got to be, we gotta be careful not to be careless. Unbelief, abusing the grace, this disobedience can hinder our ability to stand firm and defeat the enemy in our lives. Folks, when you tolerate sin, when, when you refuse to forgive, when you rely on personal righteousness, it takes away from your relationship with God. And it breaks it down piece by piece. And in effect, we lose that protection. 
There's just a couple more items. So one, one's being fitting our feet with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The shoes help to take the good news of forgiveness through Jesus Christ to, who, to those who need salvation. That's our job. That is our job. At the end of the day, every single person sitting in here is to go out there and say, hey, I love Jesus Christ, can I tell you that? Satan would want us to think that that task is too difficult of helping win the lost souls. The shoes of God give us motivation to continue to be his witness throughout the world. And our steps are guided by God. You ain't got to worry about where you got to go. God's going to take you where you need to go if you allow him to. And he won't steer you wrong. He, you might look up every now and then and say, you sure? I've done that quite a few times. You sure this is where I'm going? And he steered me wrong yet. Last thing Satan wants is for the gospel to be spread. So he's going to try everything he can to put obstacles in your way. He's going to try to rip that shoe off like the wicked witch did. The ruby red slippers. Folks, as long as you've got Jesus Christ in your heart, he can't touch it. He can't stop you from spreading the word out. Verse 16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. With our belts intact, sword in hand, or shield up, we can take any shot that the devil throws at us. Anything. And the shield will help us to hold our ground and deflect any and all insults that, they, that can be thrown our way. Verse 17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In order to put it on, you kind of first need to know what this helmet is. It's like the breastplate of righteousness. And it's borrowed directly from the description of the divine warrior in Isaiah 59 17. It says he put on righteousness as his breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. In fact, God's righteousness and his people's salvation occur together frequently in Isaiah. It's God's righteousness, his reliable commitment to fulfill all his promises to his people. It means he's got to act to deliver them from enemies, including the greatest enemy of all. What's the greatest enemy of all? Anybody know? It ain't the devil. It's your sin. Your sin is the greatest enemy that you have. We love our sin. And you should never be able to say that before we do. We like the stuff that makes us feel good. We love our sin. And that sin is the one thing that can absolutely separate you from God. The firm promise of God provides the basis for, for secure hope in midlife trials and difficulties. In Thessalonians 5, I don't think this was up there. Thessalonians 5, 8, Paul described this piece of armor more fully as the helmet and hope of salvation. That helmet is the Christian's hope for salvation. And finally, the sword of spirit. Probably one of the more important pieces. It's the thing that's our job. It's what we're to do. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. The only offensive weapon in the whole armor. It's the only one you can use to really hurt the enemy. And this world has done all it can to rid itself of the word of God. And every once in a while, they get close. I know over my lifetime, there's been times I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. But turn on the news. Whew. They won't allow it here. They don't want it here. They don't want it here. And it gets close. But then the word starts coming back because God's people said, nah. Even schools these days, you know, they're allowing time for, for people to pray. They're allowing time for people to get together before school, after school. The Word's not... We can't let the Word go away. We have to continue to yield that soul. The Word of God can instantly stop the devil on a dime and make him back up. It's all we need. If we may meditate, we memorize all we can, then we can have that offense we need to ward off the attack from Satan.
It's sharp and it will never, never dull as long as we keep our eyes on the Lord. And our faces in this book. For some of us, this is probably the hardest thing we try to do all week long. Is read the Bible. We think, we think just because maybe we thought about God that day, we, we did all right. Folks, there's always, I don't care what you turn this book to, what page you turn it to. Sure, it has the same words in it, but the meaning changes each and every time. This book is there as a road map, a guide for you and me so that we can get through this life and on to the next one. We've got to stay in the Word. At times we fail to put on this armor that we talk about. We get busy with our own pursuits and then struggles sneak up on us. And we try to fight our own battle with our own strength. And I'm telling you now, when you step out from under the Lord's strength, temptation's waiting right there every single time. A lot of times we lie instead of speaking the truth. We harbor bitterness instead of forgiving. We slander instead of pursuing peace. We justify sin instead of repenting of it. Man, we're good at that. Wasn't my fault. That sin, what that sin didn't have nothing to do with me. We indulge our lust instead of loving God. We grieve the spirit and we sap our own joy. And when these fiery guards strike us, we're left wounded and weary. But here's the kicker. Yes, you might take some shots and your armor fell off, but the quicker you realize that, you can put that armor right back on. You can put it right back on and it's ready to use. You. you can't lose heart, but we're to cry out to God, our great Savior, who leaves none of his fellow soldiers behind. He will not allow us to be snatched from his grasp. And that's scripture. John 10, 28. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. There is a promise you can take to the bank. Rather, he will throw us over his shoulder and take us to green pastures and still waters. Psalm 23. One of the most beautiful scriptures ever written. In him we are strengthened to go back into battle knowing that our Heavenly Father will soon crush Satan under his feet. I talk about the power of Satan a lot and the lack thereof. If you have the armor of God on, he cannot touch you. And you need to face every day knowing that. And thank God every morning that you've got it on. And we've covered all this pretty quick. Or at least I thought it was quick. Nobody, I didn't have to deal. Hey, wake up. Uh, but I think you could spend hours and hours and hours and hours on this subject. So I, 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 I would ask that you go home this week, find a study on it, and keep it in your mind. That protection is there if you know Jesus Christ in your heart. If you leave what this world wants you to focus on behind and allow Jesus to guide your steps, you have all the protection you need from Satan. But if you don't know him in your heart, you are left without that protection. And folks, the devil's waiting around every corner. Just waiting for you, just to wait to see that armor fall. Make that day the day where you say, not today, Satan. <coughs> Jokingly, I say that every time I come to a yellow light. Not today, Satan. Say it every day. Wake up in the morning and as soon as your feet hit the ground, say, not today, Satan. Not going to happen. I love my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and, and you no longer have dominion over me. Amen. Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the protection that you offer. Lord, I pray that, that you just, we get weak we fall, we stumble. But I pray that every single person in here realizes that when we stumble, you are there to pick us up if we allow it. If we allow you into our hearts, if we allow you to become a part of our life, Lord, every single day gets better. Every single day we see changes that can happen. 
Every single day that armor gets stronger and stronger and stronger. If we look to you. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for so many of the blessings you have placed upon us in this church, in this world. But Lord, I pray that we all look inside our hearts. That we start deflecting that negativity. And we start enjoying the peace of knowing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And that account has been paid. And now it's time to get to work. It's in your heavenly name of prayer.